to the second public lecture organized as a part of the 88th annual meeting of the Indian Academy of Sciences. I am pleased to introduce the speaker here, Dr. Ananya Vajpayee, who is an academic and a writer. Dr. Vajpayee received her MA at the Jawaharlal Nehru University, MPhil from the University of Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar and a PhD from the University of Chicago. She is currently a fellow at the Center for the Study of Developing Societies. She works at the intersection of intellectual history, political theory, and critical philology. Her research interests and areas of teaching span a wide range from the history and politics of caste and other forms of social inequality in India, the life and work of Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, ethnic conflict, religious nationalism to themes of love, violence, moral order, justice, and transcendence in classical Sanskrit texts, the history of art and architecture, and Indian and Western classical music. Ananya Vajpayee has taught at the National Law School of India, University, Bangalore, School of International and Political Affairs, Columbia University, the University of Massachusetts in Boston, where she was a tenure track faculty, and the University of Venice, Italy. She has been a visiting fellow and collaborated with many national and international universities and schools. She was a visiting fellow and Charles Wallace India Trust Fellow at the Center for Research in the Arts, Social Sciences and Humanities at the University of Cambridge, a Global Ethics Fellow with the Carnegie Council on Ethics in International Affairs, a Kluge Fellow at the John W. Kluge Center, the Library of Congress, Washington DC, and a Senior Fellow with the American Institute of Indian Studies. Dr. Ananya Vajpayee writes regularly for newspapers and magazines in India and abroad. And her book titled The Righteous Republic, The Political Foundations of Modern India won the 41st Thomas J. Wilson Memorial Award in 2011-12 and the Tata First Book Prize and the Crossword Award. We are pleased to have Dr. Ananya Vajpayee here today to speak on the modern life of an ancient language. Over to you, Ananya. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Wagmari. So the modern life of an ancient language. Um, I'll be telling you um, a few things from a book that I'm currently writing, which sets out to answer two questions. <clears throat> what is Sanskrit and why do we care about it? I investigate what makes the language live despite its purported death, what makes it modern despite its origins and efflorescence in the distant past, what has allowed it to travel outside of the Indian subcontinent for as long as it has existed, and what lifts it out of the dead letter of ritual and scholasticism into the seething battleground of religion and politics in India today. The contemporary climate of reaction and revivalism in India and worldwide gives Sanskrit a new lease of life. The Bharatiya Janata Party first came to power in 2014 with a huge majority. Many of this government's intellectual ideologues and culture warriors, both within India and in the Indian diaspora, especially in the United States, push Sanskrit as a core symbol of Hindu civilizational supremacy and neo-nationalistic pride. The role that this classical language is forced to play in a regime of the Hindu right invites us to revisit its long history and reimagine its possible futures. Like many millions of middle-class children growing up in modern India, privileged enough to get a decent education, exposed to popular culture and a smattering of the classical arts, I was raised to associate Sanskrit with three distinct spheres, Hindu religion, ancient Indian history, and the possibility of scoring high marks in school exams. Brought up by a Hindu father and a Sikh mother, neither of whom was particularly observant, I casually and almost imperceptibly learned to recite and sing Sanskrit prayers and verses during re religious festivals, rituals, and ceremonies without thinking too much about what these sacred formulae meant for this life or the afterlife. 
In both public discussion and more learned environments, it was clear that Sanskrit belonged to India's past, when the great epics were composed, when philosophy, poetry, music, dance and drama thrived, when temples were built and empires flourished. This was all very long ago, in an era whose antiquity was indubitable, but also remote, something to be vaguely proud of, but not very concerned with in our everyday experience as citizens of a diverse, noisy, and in-your-face democracy. As for practicalities, Sanskrit was a high-scoring optional subject, offered in middle school, leading up to a board exam in class 10, which nerdy students with a penchant for memorizing inflexible grammatical rules and precise case endings, conjugations and declensions, could always use to boost their grades in an otherwise punishing exam system. The same geeky kids, which included me, by the way, who opted for Sanskrit as one of their electives were usually also good at mathematics and computer science, like all of you here. Um, the language might be useless in real life, but it could prove useful on an otherwise distracted and culturally ignorant teenager's report card. Sanskrit also represented a sort of linguistic backbone in a country where 22 languages are officially recognized, and 17 of these at least appear on every currency note, including Hindi, English, Sanskrit, and 14 others where there is no agreed upon and constitutionally imposed national language, and where something between 700 and 900 languages and dialects are attested to exist and to have at least some speakers, even if a few of these languages might be on the verge of extinction or are being continually assimilated into more powerful languages which have larger speech communities. I believe in your media meeting you hosted Professor Ganesh Devi, so you had probably heard the story from him already. A majority of India's modern languages are historically descended from or derived from Sanskrit. The national anthem, as you all know, a short sweet paean to the beloved country written by the poet Rabindranath Tagore, is in Bengali heavily laced with Sanskrit, a string of nouns and vocatives with almost no syntax that most citizens can decipher no matter which modern Indian language they speak. Continuing on through college and university, I became a scholar of languages and literatures. As I grew up and went abroad to study, belatedly and from afar, I realized that you couldn't even begin to fathom the massive and multilingual intellectual history of the Indian subcontinent without a modicum of Sanskrit. This is true across religious traditions, including counterintuitively Indic Islam, across philosophical schools, across geographical regions, across historical periods, across language families, and across the modern vernaculars. All 22 of them, or all 750 of them, however you prefer to map and quantify India's preposterous linguistic diversity. In a manner that is at once plainly obvious and stunningly surprising, even for those of us with some rudimentary linguistic training, Sanskrit is the mother tongue, the fountainhead, and the bedrock. There are an estimated 30 million texts in Sanskrit, most of them lying unread, unprinted, and unedited in manuscript form, in private homes, in temples, and monasteries all over India. A small fraction of, the, of these have made it to libraries, archives, archives and digital platforms, um, a lot of those in the West, whence Indian and foreign scholars may access them, usually only with considerable difficulty. One's first entry into Sanskrit is inevitably daunting. It involves memorizing, identifying, and applying complex grammatical rules and countless word meanings. It takes work, hours of dedicated linguistic labor, every single day for years, if not for the rest of your life. Like classical music, you have to use it or you lose it. Learning it is only half the battle. Repetition is the real key to achieving a basic level of competence. This is particularly challenging when you are almost never going to encounter a linguistic environment where Sanskrit is being spoken in ordinary life. You will never come across a community of speakers for whom this is their language of everyday communication. 
At best, you might have to speak a few phrases in a Sanskrit pedagogical setting. And here, what you are likely to say or hear will be highly constrained by the text that is being taught or, or learned. Now, practice makes perfect. That's the proverb. The very word Sanskrit in English, Samskrita in Sanskrit, means perfectly constructed, a construction par excellence. The perfection of this perfectly constructed language can only be realized through practice, which in our times means mostly just reading. Once you start to be able to read, however, the rewards are directly proportional to the effort you put in. A universe of texts dating from anything starting around 1500 BCE to the present, the most famous of them composed between 200 and 1200 of the Christian era, in every conceivable discipline and genre begin to open themselves up to you. You might realize as a pious Hindu, or even just as a modern Indian of whatever religion, that you have a remarkable amount of passive knowledge of Sanskrit texts, especially of the two great epics, the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. If you are willing to explore classical Indology, which is the Western subject area that corresponds roughly to the study of Greek and Latin classics, you will in addition find a vast ocean of Sanskrit texts translated into European languages, along with a huge scholarly literature, especially in English, German, and French. In ancient compendia um, uh, of Sanskrit narratives and parables, like the Kathasarit Sagara, the Panchatantra, the Jatakas, the Vetala Panchavimshati, etc., lie the origins of the world's, many of the world's fairy tales and story cycles, scattered as far afield as Russia, Arabia, and Iran. You will also find translations and secondary materials in Chinese, Tibetan, Arabic, Persian, Italian, Japanese, Hebrew, Turkish, the other great languages that are peers of Sanskrit in the ancient and medieval worlds. If you truly have a love of language, which is the real meaning of the word philology, then you could hardly ask for greater riches than those afforded by Sanskrit. At first, I was enthralled by what learning Sanskrit had unlocked for me. One of the first texts I read was the Bhagavad Gita, the Song of the Lord. All of you are familiar with it. A long metaphysical dialogue embedded in the epic, the Mahabharata. Here, the valorous prince Arjuna, about to enter the battlefield in a fratricidal war against his cousins, discusses his fear and anxiety with his charioteer, who happens to be the god Krishna, come down to earth in human form. Krishna, cast as a non-combatant driver, turns out to be a combination of guru and shrink, coach and advisor to the wretched Arjuna, who would rather die than go and face half his kinsmen, teachers, and childhood friends across the battle line. During World War II, Many of you may know this, the Gita inspired equally the nuclear scientist J. Robert Oppenheimer, the inventor of the atom bomb, as it did Mahatma Gandhi, modern India's most famous advocate of nonviolence. So here is the blind king Dhritarashtra. This is the very first line of the Bhagavad Gita, asking his assistant Sanjaya, the narrator of the Gita, to describe to him the scene of the battle. He says, you know, you, you know this, uh, Dhritarashtra Uvacha, Dharma Kshetre, Kuru Kshetre, Samaveta, Yuyutsava, etc. When they assembled eager to fight on the field of righteousness, the field of Kuru, what did my sons and the sons of Pandu do, O Sanjaya? Right? So he's asking to set the, the ball rolling in a sense. Here is Arjuna. Um, who says to Krishna, Arjuna is the, is, is the sort of protagonist of this, this conversation, um, senayor ubhayor madhye ratham sthapaye me achyuta, right? So achyuta, Krishna, put my chariot between the two armies so I can see the warriors drawn up, keen on battling one another. Whom do I have to fight in this war? 
Krishna, at the sight of my own kin standing here ready to fight, my limbs feel tired and my mouth has gone dry. My body is trembling and my hair stands on end. I see no good in killing my own family, Swajanam, in war. And here is Krishna revealing himself to Arjuna in his cosmic form. Kalo Asmi says, I am time. The world destroyer ripened. Here I am busy crushing the worlds. Even without you, all the warriors drawn up in the opposing ranks will cease to exist. So get up and win your fame. Conquer your enemies and enjoy full sovereignty. I myself have long since doomed them to perish. You just be the instrument. Kill them, for I have already slain them. Don't hesitate, fight. You will conquer your rivals in battle. I read Kalidasa's glorious 5th century poem, The Meghaduta, The Cloud Messenger, where a half-crazy, semi-divine character, a yaksha, Exiled from his home and separated from his beloved, addresses a passing cloud, sending back various ardent messages for his lady love, oblivious of his messengers in sentience. Intriguingly, the cloud travels from the pining lover to his estranged beloved, bearing a lovelorn message, take it over a vast territory that looks very much like a map of ancient India, as seen from an aerial view. Perhaps in their own way, the cartographers who are working at the Survey of India, and they recently came up with a, with a Sanskrit map with all the place names in Sanskrit, have a buried memory of the poet Kalidasa's breathtaking geography playing on their minds. And here is the Yaksha uh, talking to the cloud, to his friend. He says, before you listen, O cloud, to my sweet sounding message, First, let me tell you a favorable route for your journey. So they're setting up a sort of GPS. Um, along which, along this route, whenever you are tired, you shall rest on mountains, on mountain tops, and whenever you are spent, you shall enjoy the wholesome water of streams before going on your way. I read the utterly gorgeous and deeply mysterious Kathopanishad, a difficult story and the Chandogya Upanishad, a secret metric, co composed in an ancient, almost primordial Sanskrit around the very beginning of the first millennium. Here you can see the wondrous emergence of poetic expression, of existential reflection, and of authorial self-awareness in the midst of both a sylvan natural environment and early human society, blossoming before your very eyes, as it were. Pairs of characters, a teacher and the, his disciple, a man and his wife, a human and an animal, a boy and death, talk to one another, telling stories, asking questions, recounting memories, floating theories, and exchanging knowledge. The Upanishads are moving and somewhat elusive texts from which we get the sense of a genuinely pre-modern stage of human consciousness, when the boundaries between the self and the other, culture and nature, cognition and articulation are not rigidly set yet, and the world is wide open for the human eye seeing it and the human mind trying to make sense of it. Here is Nachiketa, thinking aloud after his father has told him, his father has given him to death. His father has told him to go die. And here he says, I go as the first of many. He's thinking, where am I going? Where is my father sending me? I go as the first of many. I go as the middlemost of many. What's it that Yama, Lord of Death, must do that he will do with me today? He says, um, um, you know, both... Prathamo and Madhyamaha, right, um, uh, of many, uh, you know, of, 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 of Bahuna, right, um, I, I, am, I, I have to go. And then he says, look ahead. He says to himself, Anupashya yatha purve pratipashya tatha, tatha pare. Meaning, look ahead, see how they have gone, um, those who have gone before us, look back. So they will go, those who will come after us. We're all going to death. We're all going to die. 
a mortal man ripens like green and like green is born again. I read Ashwa Ghosha's second century Buddha Charita, The Life of the Buddha, a window into possibly the most historically grounded character to emerge from what uh, one historian calls the myth smoke of ancient India. The story of the Buddha's enlightenment and his teachings in the form of Buddhism are some of the most widely circulated narratives and doctrines to come out of India and travel abroad in the ancient world. The journey of the spoiled and naive Prince Siddhartha towards a difficult knowledge of human suffering, bodily decay, and ineluctable mortality makes him Buddha, literally knowledgeable, awakened, or enlightened. Here is Siddhartha, the young prince, as he sets out to seek his enlightenment and dismisses Chandaka, his groomsman, sending him back to his father, King Shuddhodhana, along with this horse, um, Kanthaka. For when a man passes away, he's telling, he's telling the, the groomsman, just as he's sending him off, when a man passes away, there are heirs to his wealth, but heirs to dharma on this earth are absent or hard to find. Should you argue that I have departed to the forest at an improper time? I would say, for pursuing dharma there is no time that's proper when life is so insecure. Therefore I have resolved, I must this very day seek final bliss. For what trust can one place in life when death, its foe, is standing by? I read texts that I, like many Indians, had the greatest familiarity with, quite apart from any interest in or knowledge of Sanskrit, the two epics, the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. Both are massive and seldom read in their entirety. Rather, one can go to chapters or books that contain one's, one's favorite characters, stories, scenes, or lines. For Indians of my generation, the time at which we came to know the epics from beginning to end occurred actually in the late 1980s when both texts, both epics were made into television series and broadcast weekly on Sunday mornings on what was then the only TV channel, the state-run Doordarshan. Before that, one heard bits and pieces of the epics as bedtime stories from parents and grandparents, or went one, one could go to um, folk performances of the Ramayana, uh, which, of course, in North India we call the Ramlila, during the autumn season, which is ongoing of Navratri, Dashera, Durga Puja, Diwali, etc., every year. From this early exposure to texts, <laughs> which were mainly literary, my own love affair with Sanskrit got off to a good start. Sanskrit must be read with teachers and fellow students. Matters for me jumped to a higher level altogether once my teachers began to introduce me to formal philosophical treatises in a genre called Shastra, literally discipline or disciplined knowledge. The term Shastra, treatise, science, authoritative book, comes from the same root that yields shasana and anushasana, that is to say, rule, which includes both disciplinary rule and political rule. It is also close to the root of shastra, or weapon, which is altogether a telling semantic field, spanning everything from teaching and instructing to killing and injuring. Shastra, shastra. The shared sense of authority, of rigor, and of punishment is present in all these terms. In other words, the creators and purveyors of systematic thought in Sanskrit had worked out two millennia or more ago the mutually implicating relationship between knowledge and power. It was not surprising then that slowly learning to master Sanskrit gave one a heady feeling of intellectual prowess. Unlike anything I had ever experienced, at least from the things that I had learned, for example, let's say um, South Asian history or, or, or English literature or Hindustani music or, or critical theory or anything. Like every student of Sanskrit, I too became addicted to its self-definitions of perfection and mastery, Sanskrita which tend to insidiously spread from the language to its user, from the text to its reader, in short, from ideology to consciousness. 
I was becoming thus a Brahmin. Sanskrit has from its earliest attested history been associated with the social class that we call Brahmin. The equation may be formulated as a commutative one. Sanskrit is the language to which Brahmins have access and having access to Sanskrit is the greater part of what it means to be a Brahmin. Being Brahmin is a sociological fact. It means being born into a caste, traditionally an elite and educated section of Indian society, a stratum, all male, of course, of ritual specialists, priests, teachers, and scholars. What I am referring to in claiming that my engagement with Sanskrit was turning me into a Brahmin is not actually to do with my birth, my caste, my name, my class, my occupation, or my profession. Although confusingly, in India, I would be called a Brahmin by such yardsticks as well. But, but let's bracket that for now. We have to bracket my gender also, by the way. Rather, I am referring to a dynamic of mastery over language corresponding to a feeling of entitlement and arrogance that can have profound implications beyond the text, the classroom, or the library, manifesting itself in the world outside, as it were, within a larger matrix that has for centuries strongly correlated specialized knowledge with social power. What I am alluding to here is an epistemic state, that is to say, say a state of, 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 of knowing, that has ethical consequences. A way of thinking and knowing that affects both how you are in yourself and how you relate to others. In the narcissism of its own perfection, Sanskrit has the capacity to construct a very particular dominating self for those who take it on. Living with Sanskrit is like riding a tiger. Not for nothing the red alert cue in the similar sounding words, the roots of shas and shas, right? To rule and to master, to discipline and to punish. As a, as, a, as a good Indian follower of Michel Foucault, I was excited by this moment of self-knowledge, as, as excited as I was alarmed by what I had gotten myself into. Sanskrit Shastra texts continue to exert a strong cultural fascination throughout the modern period. Let me illustrate. In the intellectual history of modern India, 1909 was a turning point. That year, Mohandas Gandhi, a middle-aged Gujarati lawyer based in South Africa, wrote his slim but Galilean, I would say, uh, freedom charter, Hind Swaraj, or Indian Home Rule, which made the case for ending British colonialism in India. Vinayak Savarkar, the father of Hindu nationalism or Hindutva, published an English translation of his Marathi history uh, of the Sepoy Mutiny, the Indian War of Independence, of 1857, which he anonymously signed by an Indian nationalist. And in that same year, down south, Dr. R. Shama Shastri, the chief librarian of the Mysore Government Oriental Library, published the uh, Editio Princeps of, of uh, the principal edition of Kautilya's Arthashastra, a Sanskrit work on politics and statecraft. Um, then thought to date at the time uh, of, Sh of Shama Shastri's edition in 1909 from the reign of the Emperor Chandragupta, which is um, um, something like 321 to 297 uh, before the Christian era. Chandragupta, of course, you know, was the founder of the Mauryan Kingdom, which was the earliest imperial polity covering a huge part of the subcontinent. The influence of Gandhi and Savarkar on the making of modern India is undisputed. But how did the Arthashastra, which was an erudite treatise from Indic antiquity, become one of the key books from ancient India to have an important career in modern times? For the Arthashastra is not just a relic of a remote past. It actually continues to animate discussions about political life in contemporary India. Defense analysts, management gurus, op-ed page pundits at Indian think tanks are fond of quoting the Arthashastra. A case stands to be made that the discovery of the Arthashastra in early 20th century southern India has a significant role to play in the still evolving elaboration of the idea 
of an Indian modernity. In India today, the Arthashastra is considered analogous to Aristotle's politics and Machiavelli's prince. Its topics include kingship, governance, and law in early India. Its perspectives on these subjects have proved to be as important to the project of Indian modernity as the theories of violence and nonviolence, state, community, and self-rule authored by such political thinkers and founding figures of the post-colonial Indian nation as Gandhi, Ambedkar, Tagore, and their peers. British India's foremost anti-colonial leader and Free India's first Prime Minister, Jawaharlal Nehru, brings up the Arthashastra half a dozen times in his classic popular history, The Discovery of India, 1946, which was written in jail on the eve of independence. Sixty years later, Amartya Sen, our Nobel laureate in economics, finds this work still important for us in his book, The Argumentative Indian, which was uh, published in 2005. I became particularly interested, I'm still continuing to tell the story autobiographically, I became particularly interested in Mimamsa, a form of extremely complex hermeneutics developed in the first millennium, specifically to read, analyze, and interpret the Veda, the primary textual corpus of Sanskrit, at first um, oral and not written, whose origins remain unclear, and whose survival into the present is without exaggeration one of the intellectual wonders of the world. The Veda is also arguably the foundation of most, if not all, schools of Hindu doctrine. Buddhists and Jains reject the foundational authority of the Veda, something that has generated centuries of rich argumentation between the Vedic traditions and their philosophical adversaries. Mimamsa is Shastra, at its most abstruse. It focuses on the Vedic text qua text and ignores or subordinates the historical context in which the Veda might have been embedded. In a sense, it is the zenith of caste consciousness, a discourse of, for, and by Brahmins, in which tricky questions of religious authority and social hierarchy can be bracketed entirely because no other group besides Brahmins needs to enter the closed conversation about Vedic ritual and its meaning. It's all Brahmin men speaking amongst themselves in an erudite, coded register, almost like members of a secret society. 99% <laughs> of the real world, including other castes and women, do not have access to the Mimamsa. For my dissertation research, now a long time ago at the University of Chicago, I started looking at treatises of Dharma Shastra, texts of a normative, legal, and juridical nature, ancient law books, so to speak. Here is Shastra or systematic knowledge concerned with Dharma, Dharma Shastra, right? One of those basic and maddening Sanskrit categories that cannot be translated that has multiple meanings and whose entire semantic range you have to keep in mind at all times for you to know what it means in any given instance. Dharma is law, religion, order, morality, duty, righteousness. It is what upholds the world. It, give, it is God-given. It is also man-made. It is foundational. It is transcendent. It is eternal. It is contingent. It is steadfast and mutating. It is the plinth and it is the axis. But dharma also means Hindu religion and caste system. If you ask most Indians today what the word means to them, then these are the two meanings that they would readily provide. It means Hindu dharma, which means Hindu religion in, in, in uh, normal parlance, and it means Varnashrama dharma or the caste system. In reading texts of the Dharma Shastra, I began to unearth the recessed but very robust connection between Sanskrit and the Brahmin, between normativity, norm, norm, normative order and caste, between moral order and social order, between what we read and what we believe, between how we think and how we live. Like other modern students of Sanskrit before me, I too came upon the most profound immemorial basis of inequality in India. Inequality has a stupendous trans-historical superstructure of ideological justification in India. 
you could go for centuries without the idea of equality arising in the otherwise boundlessly creative Indian mind, which has given to the world everything from the zero to nirvana, from yoga to ahimsa, from Gautama Buddha to Mahatma Gandhi. The tiger you ride is the one that you cannot afford to dismount. The Rig Veda, now the first of the four, four Vedic uh, uh, corpora, contains a famous verse called the Purusha Sukta, the hymn uh, Sukta about Purusha. So Purusha is uh, the primordial sacrificial victim, the primordial man. And this hymn describes the origins of the world by the sacrifice of Purusha where each section of his body, as it is sacrificed, produces one of the four social classes, right? So, yagnyena yagnyam ayajanta deva thantani dharmani prathamani asan, that this is how the world was created. The gods performed this sacrifice, they sacrificed the purusha. As each part of his body was sacrificed, a different part of the world came from it. This cosmological hymn is thought to be the earliest attestation of the caste system in the entire Sanskrit literature. This hymn naturalizes the social order. The world is already created with social hierarchy in place. Anthropomorphically mapped to the human body, society has a head, shoulders, legs, and feet. It has superiority and inferiority built into it, a top and a bottom. From his mouth came forth men of learning. This is the Purusha. Of his arms were warriors made, so Brahmanas, Kshatriyas. From his thighs came traders and merchants, Vaishyas. And his feet gave birth to servants, Padbhyam, Shudro, Ajayata. Right? Now, the particular Shastra text that, as a doctoral student, I was researching for my own dissertation were composed between um, the 14th and the 17th century. Um, and they all had to do with this narrow topic within the vast purview of, of dharma, which is the situation of the shudra, shudra dharma, the lowest in this four-tier hierarchy of caste, at the top of which sits the Brahman. The Shudra is figured as the feet of the sacrificial cosmic man, Purusha, described in the Rig Veda, as I just read to you, about 2,500 years before the texts that I was interested in researching. Now, the difference between Shastra, which is an authoritative text, and Shastra, which is a weapon that you can use to maim or to murder, is just one lengthening of the vowel, a, uh, right? Shastra, 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 right? Shastra, Shastra. Just the A uh goes from short to long. And this proved too frail a distinction to actually keep them apart. That's what I felt. The Shudra, according to the voluminous articles of law listed in, in the treatises of Shudra Dharma that I was reading, was disallowed from all avenues that might lead to his emancipation from marriage above his station, the ownership of property, opting out of his inherited and demeaning occupations, and education which might catapult him to another level in society, and from religious rituals considered to have liberating effects through the cumulative improvement of one's individual karma. All of this, the Shudra, is not allowed. But the foundational denial of access on which all of these other exclusions rest is to the utterance of Sanskrit. The Shudra may not utter Sanskrit, may not study the Veda, may not pronounce mantras, may not perform rituals which require Vedic mantras. And the Shudra is banned or debarred from the knowledge that resides with Brahmins and with their sacred texts. Now, the most eloquent modern critic of social inequality entailed by a Brahmin worldview and its monopoly of the Sanskrit language and its disciplines was, of course, Dr. Bhimrao Ambedkar, um, whom you all know. What many people don't know, of course, Ambedkar helped to write the Constitution and Ambed Ambedkar 
as a modern leader of 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 the un, of the untouchables now known as dalits but in 1946 on the eve of india's independence from british rule he wrote a book titled who were the shudras how they came to be the fourth varna in indo aryan society in this very complex work which i'm not able to summarize he looks at a range of linguistic ethnographic anthropological religious and historical materials to try and figure out the deep sources of social inequality that exist in india in its peculiar and timelessly resilient form of the caste system he refers to a range of characters in the sanskrit literature this is ambedkar mainly from the upanishads and from the epics fictional figures mythic figures who are familiar to indians through their stories that are widely disseminated and thoroughly absorbed into many of our literary cultures whether classical or vernacular traditional or modern these characters are usually marginal or ambiguous in terms of their caste status we can't quite tell whether these characters are shudra or not and the narratives in which they appear are in fact designed precisely to question challenge problematize or break the rules of caste hierarchy and caste inequality so satya kama who appears in the chandogya upanishad um he is an aspiring student uh but he is the son of a single mother who doesn't know who his father is and he is nonetheless admitted into a brahmin seminary into a gurukula because the guru who heads it gautama appreciates the young man's honesty when he asks him what's your gotra who's your father he says i don't know i am the son of jabala so i am satya kama jabali um and gautama rishi appreciates his honesty and disregards his caste status which could possibly be non brahmin and allows him to be admitted into his his um his his ashram shambuka uh, another such character occurs in the last book of the ramayana the uh, the the uh, uttara the post the post uh, war post return to ayodhya the last very last book of the ramayana the uttara kanda um Shambuka is a shudra ascetic i'm sure many people in south india are familiar with uh, with shambuka in, in i know that in karnataka is uh, you know very prominent figure in in kannada literature um shambuka is a shudra ascetic a shudra tapasvi and he is killed by uh, rama for practicing austerities tapas which are actually disallowed to somebody of his low birth Now Rama has been made to believe that killing a shudra will restore life to a young brahmin boy who has inexplicably died a small boy has died is a brahmin his parents come to rama and they say what kind of king are you what kind of kingdom have you uh, got going here our child has died for no fault of his you must revive our child and rama is advised to go and find a sinning shudra to kill the shudra and restore life to the brahmin boy so um uh, the beheading of an ascetic whatever its legal justification is a morally questionable act now here is rama he's he's tormented um you know at least in bhavabhuti's uh, uttara ramacharita rama's last act this is a 8th century sanskrit playwright um and and this is a, a play by him in which uh, you know um the the episode of shambuka's killing occurs and and here is rama he's facing um he's facing um uh shambuka and he's about to kill him and he's hesitating he's hesitating just like arjuna hesitates before entering the battle in kurukshetra rama is hesitating and so rama addresses his own right hand where he's holding the sword and he's hesitating um and he says he hast dakshina oh my right hand rama talking to his own hand says bring down the sword upon the shudra monk bring the dead son of the brahman back to life right it's 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 a terrible thing but he has to do it you are a limb of ramas he says to his own hand 
which Rama, Rama who had it in him to drive his Sita into exile, weary and heavy with child, right? So he's guilty about an earlier immoral act which he has committed, which is banishing his own wife and not trusting her chastity when she was pregnant. Um, and he says, why should you take pity on Shambhuka when you never took pity? He's saying to himself, when you never took pity on Sita. So he says, why start with pity now? Karuna kutaste. Right? He has the dakshina. Karuna kutaste. Right? Um, so here's another character, Shambhuka, um, you know, whose story problematizes uh, our understanding of, of caste relations. Ekalavya in the Mahabharata is a forest dwelling tribal prince um, whose skill as an archer exceeds that of Arjuna the Pandava. He belongs, Arjuna belongs to the warrior caste, he's a Kshatriya, and uh, Ekalavya is a tribal. He's a Nishada, he's the son of the Nishada Raja, right? So Drona, Dronacharya, who is the teacher of Arjuna, cruelly demands Ekalavya's right thumb, right? Um, uh, angushtam uh, dakshinam, he says, you, you know, give me your right thumb. If I am your guru, you've treated me as your guru, then give me your right thumb as my fee, right? Vetanam, he says, give it to me as, as my fee, but he's actually asking for it as a punishment for daring to teach himself archery and excelling at it to threaten Arjuna's position as a paragon, as, as, as the greatest archer alive. Um, and the way that these verses are, are written in the Mahabharata suggests that um, really we should feel sympathy for Eklavya and not, not for Drona and certainly not for Arjuna in this instance. Now, a female character, an elderly woman ascetic Shabari, uh, she's to be found in the Ramayana. Um, and she's much more prominent in Tulsi Das's Ramcharitmanas. She's not actually very prominent in the in uh, Valmiki's Ramayana. Um, she's an elderly female ascetic. Um, uh, she serves uh, Rama and his brother Lakshmana. Um, they're, they're going looking for Sita. Sita has been abducted and they're going looking and they're just stopping on the way and meeting all kinds of characters. And Shabari is one of them. Uh, and she, she looks after them when, when, when they pass by her, her place. Um, and she's rewarded for her devotion by being liberated from the cycle of rebirth. Now, neither her humble station as a servant nor her sex as a woman stands in the way of Rama's indulgence, which shows us how contingent and negotiable caste and gender can be after all. Exceptions are constantly being made. For Ambedkar, what figures like Satyakama, Shambhuka, Ikalavya, and Shabari, um, names that are recognizable to all of us, even if we have a passing familiarity with, with the epics, what, what these figures establish is that we cannot disentangle the Sanskrit language, the Brahmin class, and the Hindu religion. This is Ambedkar's conclusion. If the caste system is to go, then one has to somehow find a way to either destroy it, the annihilation of caste, or one has to opt out of this entire matrix of knowledge and power. Since the former, the destruction of Hinduism, is unlikely to come about, in the end, Ambedkar declared that he would no longer remain a Hindu. He announced that he was renouncing or rather denouncing Hinduism and instead converting to Buddhism, an egalitarian and emancipatory creed. It took him about 25 years between 1932 and 1956 to cover this ground, but that's another story. So at first, I too, since I was reading Ambedkar, I saw these Shudra characters as symbols of the perennial injustice of the caste system. I undertook what I understood as a philology of oppression. I tried to propose a poetics of contempt based on my reading of the medieval Shudra Dharma texts as well as related narratives about Shudra subjectivity, such as these ones pointed out by Ambedkar in some of the early and well-known Sanskrit literature. 
Now, one of Ambedkar's first political acts of mass mobilization took place in December 1927. You've all uh, heard about this the, uh, at the at the Chowder uh, tank, um, where he publicly burned a copy of the Manusmriti, right, in December 1927. Um, this is also uh, the Manusmriti is, is the laws of Manu in ancient in ancient treatise. His final political act, however, in October 1956 just about seven weeks prior to his death, was to take Buddhist vows, carrying along with him nearly half a million Dalits in a mass conversion ceremony that was a first in the entire recorded history of Buddhism anywhere in the world. So as now I return after a gap of many years to the Shudra characters in the epic and the philosophical literature, I begin to notice once more the qualities of the language and of the narratives in it that had first made me fall in love with Sanskrit. I realized that while these stories were on the surface about inequality and injustice, as Ambedkar had correctly pointed out, they also contained in them irony, pathos, and ambiguity. That is, in fact, um, uh, uh, you know, what, what, what happens is that, that the reader is left with more questions than answers, more doubts than certitudes. I looked again at how the composers of the epics as well as of later, as well as how later Sanskrit poets and playwrights handled these exceptional characters like Satyakama, etc. I, I was, to my surprise, I found that even within the Sanskrit tradition, these characters were accorded a cautious or sometimes an explicit sympathy. Their uncertain state between inclusion and exclusion was marked even by the authors themselves, as well as by their later interpreters, critics, translators, and redactors within India's many literary cultures that are descended from Sanskrit. So one came away feeling disillusioned with the rigidity of a moral order and a social structure that can alienate student from teacher, man from woman, human from God, king from subject, parent from child, and so on. The stern diktats of the Shastra crumble before the subtleties and nuances of the poetic text, reminding us that language is a double-edged sword, sometimes conservative and at other times radical. I began to wonder if the power of Sanskrit is intrinsically neutral, though it can have its face turned now towards beauty and now towards violence. If the fracture, contradiction, or duality running deep in the heart of Sanskrit were not difficult enough to deal with, the present moment in India's political life adds a layer of complication that gives further impetus to this task um, that, that my teacher, Sheldon Pollock, has called critical philology. And, 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 and this, this new difficulty added to the primordial and as yet unresolved problem of inequality is that Sanskrit has become a weapon brandished by um, the Hindu right by, by right-wing nationalists who are hell-bent on transforming the secular, multi-confessional, and pluralistic Indian Republic into a Hindu Rashtra. So, um, drawing to a conclusion here, um, when I wrote uh, my first book, Righteous Republic, The Political Foundations of Modern India, I was eager to unearth the poorly understood wellsprings of India's anti-colonial struggle in the vast thought universe of Sanskrit. I turned to Sanskrit sources to better understand how the founding fathers, including Gandhi, Tagore, Ambedkar, and Nehru, sought to construct a uniquely Indian political modernity. But at the time, what I neglected or ignored was that alongside these founding fathers were also all along the ideologues of the Hindu right. They were contemporaries of the figures that I was investigating. And they also turned to Sanskrit to bolster their arguments, which had a very different um, uh, connotation as regards what they saw as the shape of an ideal society, polity, and citizen. They used Sanskrit to defend the caste system, to paint Muslims as demonic others, to portray women as inferior to men, and to justify the domination of some classes and groups over all others within Indian society. 
Now, what Hindu nationalists had in common with secular nationalists was the impulse to draw on ethical and epistemological resources from within India, principally from the world of Sanskrit, to push back against the politically dominant West. In this, the two camps were united. But what these antithetical uses of Sanskrit meant for their respective ideas of India was vastly different, indeed opposed, for the different species of nationalist era thinkers and leaders. And this difference or opposition is what I am currently focusing on in my new work. So when I began to study Sanskrit, um, I think I might, uh, I might conclude quite soon, um, I was enchanted by its beauty and captivated by its power. But as I slowly traveled further into the worlds of signification that it engendered and which in turn enabled it, I discovered a resonance between the linguistic, literary, and social registers of Sanskrit that were fundamentally pre premised on principles of inequality and hierarchy. People often say that a language isn't inherently good or bad, that there isn't any reason to blame Sanskrit. Um, as such for, for the evils of caste or of patriarchy. But I'm not so sure whether Sanskrit can so easily be let off the hook. Sanskrit is now undergoing a sort of resurrection. If not a discursive revival or a creative renaissance, then at least in as much as it is once more becoming a vital sign uh, vital as a sign of India's epistemic sovereignty through nationalistic appropriation and a reason for Hindu pride through communal appropriation. We urgently need to understand what Sanskrit means today within India and in a wider Hindu diaspora. Who is invested in its continuation and preservation and why? And, and what as scholars and lovers of the language we can do to remain vigilant about its use and abuse in a largely revivalist and reactionary political climate in India and indeed in the world. Um, and just in, in, in conclusion, I'm going to describe to you uh, a small instance of the modern life of this ancient language. So um, we turn to the 16th book of the Mahabharata, the, the Mausala Parva, right? Which means the book of clubs, Musala, right? Um, um, it's kind of archaic weapon. So we find ourselves in the 36th year of Yudhishthira's reign um, at Indraprastha. The great war is long over and an uneasy peace prevails over the Pandava kingdom. In Dwarka, Krishna's capital on the western seaboard, time is running out. Krishna recalls that the curse of the Kaurava queen mother Gandhari must eventually befall his clan, which is the clan of Rishnis. Kali Yuga, the last of the four cosmic ages, demonic in its might, awaits its beginning as soon as Krishna passes on. With the fatality, the inexorable force that marks his tenure as the incarnation of Vishnu in human form, Krishna sets the ball rolling. This will be the final denouement of a long conflict that has decimated the fraternal Yadava lineages. The supposed triumph of Yudhishthira and his brothers is marred by a permanent se sense of exhaustion. They suffer an existential, if not a military, defeat. Through a series of planned accidents and fated coincidences, through pettiness, cowardice, vengefulness, and stupidity, the Vrishnis self-destruct. The sons and kinsmen of Krishna murder one another in an orgy of violence and drunken bloodletting. Krishna is felled himself when a hunter named Jara, Jara means old age, shoots an iron-tipped arrow that pierces the sole of Krishna's foot which is the only vulnerable part of his divine body, like Achilles' heel. Arjuna cremates his dearest friend and his mentor, a task that causes him unbearable grief. The waters rise up in a huge storm, engulfing the magnificent city of Dwarka and plunging its glittering palaces to the bottom of the sea. Yudhishthira sees the writing on the wall. The war his side, which has supposedly won, has been lost after all. It is time for the Pandavas to give up their kingdom and depart for their final death march to the high Himalaya. Krishna is gone from the world of men. 
Dwapara Yuga has ended, Kali Yuga has begun in earnest. So my father, my late father was um, a Hindi poet um, named Kailash Vajpayee and one of his final connections of, of poetry uh, titled Dubasa and Duba Tara um, is actually a series of um, uh, tableau dialogues and meditations. Um, all of these unfold underneath the Ashwatha tree uh, in the mysterious Prabhas Kshetra. Prabhas Kshetra is a luminous stretch of wooded beach between land and sea where the immortal Krishna paradoxically awaits his demise. Badi gehen gatha hai hatya ki, the God says. The saga of killing is unfathomable. Krishna says to Jara in, in my father's poem, uh, the hunter, Jara actually begs his forgiveness for, for mistaking his, his darkly glowing foot for the eye of a deer. And he says, Kshama ka koi sampradaya nahi. Forgiveness transcends all sectarian difference. Asal mein kshama dhruv tara hai. Truth be told, forgiveness is the pole star. It's the one fixed point that orients the vast slow turning of the moral universe. So I reread this late book of the Mahabharata, the, the Mausala Parva, because of the sense of doom, moral collapse, and political ruin that, that colors our blood soaked, that, that, that colors this blood soaked book, and because of its unmistakable messages that civil war has no happy endings, that fratricide polarizes and ultimately hollows out a society beyond saving, that the sturdiest alliances and mightiest empires collapse before the tsunami of unethical ambition. Whatever the cast of characters, there are no gods and no heroes in the Mahabharata. It's a naked struggle for hegemony that decimates every delicate human construct with brute force. A protracted and apocalyptic battle throws all dharma, all principles, and all relationships under the wheel of a heedless, and in fact, in the figure of King Dhritarashtra, a blind will to power. Those who somehow remain after the catastrophe, they too will club one another to death. Not only are there no victors, in fact, there are no survivors either in the long run. I'll close now. The death of Krishna and the mass suicide of the Vrishnis end Yudhishthira's half-hearted reign over Hastinapura. The five Pandava brothers and their wife Draupadi set out on their final journey. As they climb ever higher into the cold and barren Himalayas, one by one they die on the way. Only Yudhishthira makes it, together with his dog, um, to the gates of Swarga, the celestial realm. Indra, the lord of God, stands there waiting to welcome the weary king but insists that he should leave behind his canine companion. Yudhishthira refuses. We have come thus far together, he says, of the beast who is waiting patiently by his side in the snow. We go on together, or I will turn back and I will die here on earth, one with my wretched family and my loyal dog. The god and the man are at an impasse, Indra and, and Yudhishthira, as the animal between them awaits its fate. But suddenly the dog disappears to be replaced by dharma, the very principle of righteousness, the law that undergirds the order of things. Dharma, Yudhishthira's progenitor, has given his son a final test, which he passes with a demonstration of that very quality of mercy, kshama, um, which Krishna discusses with his hapless assassin in my father's poem. The war may be lost, the kingdom forfeited, the band of brothers sundered, the omniscient avatar has departed, ir, uh, you know, has departed from this irredeemably flawed world, but the dog is saved, and with that justice is done. There is no further impediment for the entry into heaven. Yudhishthira ascends Indra's chariot and is whisked away into the vanishing heights of a crystal sky. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ananya, for exposing us to and also reminding us of the 
beauty, elegance, and power of Sanskrit, with references to literature over the last few thousand years, like Bhagavad Gita, Mimansa, Shuddha Dharma, Artha Shastra, and others. We were, this was a very pleasant change after our science lectures where we at most refer to the literature from the last decades or so. Uh, you also exposed us to deep connections of Sanskrit to social inequalities, relevance to the modern problems, including caste, and the ideas of Gandhi, Savarkar, uh, Ambedkar. Thank you very much. This was very enriching experience. On behalf of Indian Academy of Sciences and the SRM University, we are grateful for you to have come and delivered this public lecture. Uh, on behalf of the Academy and SRM University, we would like to hand over a memento 